On behalf of Minds Count, I'm pleased to welcome you to our 2021 Minds Count annual lecture. Thank you for taking the time to join us, what is going to be a wonderful and important discussion. Um, firstly, I'd like in terms of the acknowledgement of country, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we live, work and learn. We pay our respects to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and to elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge the individual and collective expertise of those with a living or lived experience in mental health. We recognise their vital contribution at all levels and value the courage of those who share this unique perspective for the purpose of learning and growing together to achieve better outcomes for all. My name is Melinda Upton and I'm proudly the Chair of Minds Count and I'm joined tonight with my fellow board members and I welcome all of you um, to this annual lecture. Since its beginning in August 2008, set up by Mari and George Jepson after the loss of their dear son Tristan, who took his own life, Minds Count has been committed to building greater awareness of depression and anxiety across all areas of the legal profession. Our purpose has been to be an independent hub to support initiatives within the legal profession that aim to de decrease the distress, disability, and causes of depression and anxiety in the legal profession. We released the Workplace Wellbeing Best Practice Guidelines in which more than 250 of your organisations in Australia and overseas have become signatories. The guidelines have also crossed professional boundaries with healthcare workplaces choosing to become signatories. We also provide resources and links to current national and international research initiatives and learning related to workplace psychological safety and wellbeing. And we're glad that we can all still connect during this time and our annual lecture continues to be focused on personal storytelling. And I know all of you tonight, will, it will be incredibly powerful. Hang on to your skis, everyone. I know I'm not meant to be a comedian, but that is a nod to Zali Stegel. And yes, um, I'll stick to them all. Tonight, we will hear from Zali Stegel and Rich Hurst. And following the discussion and Q&A, David Field will announce the winner of our Minds Count Award, where we recognise leadership in mental wellbeing in legal workplaces. Justice Jane Jago will also give the vote of thanks and close proceedings. So tonight we're in for a real treat. As I'm making some brief introductions, can I ask you to pop your first name, title, if you wish, location, organisation in the chat box so we can get a sense of where you are all joining from. And I'll surely pass to Rich Hurst, who is going to have a conversation with Zali. As you know, Zali is a barrister, Olympic athlete, serving as Member of Parliament for the Division of Wurringa since 2019. She's also Australia's most successfully successful alpine skier. And I was always with, watching the screen with great envy watching Zali come down those slopes. Zali's Olympic career extended from Albertville in 1992 to Salt Lake City in 2002. I'll shortly introduce you to Rich Hurst, but I also firstly just want to take an opportunity to shout out one of my board members, Dr. Greg Damore, who is a psychiatrist at the moment in the very front lines working at Westmead. Um, he's unfortunately missed the last couple of board meetings, but I guarantee you whenever that happens, he gives you advance notice with greatest apologies. We all know that he's doing incredible work. Um, we, we hope that you're on the, on the call, but totally understand if you're not, but we thank you again and all those frontline workers for the work they're doing in a very difficult situation. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to Rich Hurst. Rich is the CEO of Tenfold and for over 20 years, Rich has worked directly with more than 1,000 CEOs, 10,000 executives, plus hundreds of global thought leaders around the world in search of the answer to one question, what are the habits of high performers and what does good leadership look like? Rich is also an organisational psychiatrist and psychologist and a wonderful human being who I've had the pleasure of getting to know and his team at Tenfold on a number of projects over the last few years. So you can see the speakers clearly feel free to change your view. So speaker and gallery view, um, use the chat box, which will give you some instruction, but enjoy tonight and thank you again for your support and also your engagement. Rich, over to you. Thanks so much, Mel. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Just checking on audio before we keep going. Fabulous, fabulous. And thank you to everybody for joining us. Just looking at the chat and please do open the chat because we would love to hear your questions and thoughts as we go throughout today's discussion. Uh, Zali and I will be talking for about 20 minutes up front, and then we've got loads of time to, to, talk, to get your questions on the table and to have Zali answer those. Uh, and as you can see in the chat already, once you turn it on, we've got 
solicitors and lawyers and barristers and everyone from the legal profession from across the country, uh, certainly Perth, Melbourne, Queensland, Sydney, I can see. Someone's even in Karingai, which is where I am right now, which is fabulous. So thank you all for joining us. And again, please do use the chat. Well, uh, Mel mentioned that I'm an organisational psychologist by training. Uh, I love interviewing high performance people, elite athletes, you know, influential professionals, you know, people that have dedicated their lives to their country through politics. Normally, though, that would take three different interviews. But tonight we've got all of those things wrapped up in one person, which is amazing. Uh, you'll all know Zali Stegel. She is, as Mel mentioned, world champion alpine skier, Australia's most successful alpine skier ever. Uh, she's also, she was a barrister at the New South Wales Bar from 2008 to 2019. You also know she is the independent federal minister for Ringa in Sydney's north. And you may also know that she's a, a passionate ultra runner and ultra marathon uh, <laughs> pursuer. I don't know how you fit it all in, Zali, but somehow you do. So you might know her for all these things, but tonight we hope to go a little bit deeper and give you all a glimpse of, uh, of Zali behind the scenes. What's going on between her ears when she got, moves from all of these incredible fields into another field and how she mentally prepared herself and kept herself in a peak state. So Zali, welcome. Thank you for making time to join us tonight for the Minds Count Annual Lecture. How are you going? Oh, very good. This, I'm looking forward to this. It's uh, I miss the legal profession at times, I have to say, in the <laughs> argy-bargy of Canberra and politics. Um, sometimes the law and order of the courts would be, would be a nice relief. <laughs> 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 That's right. Heaven help us. <laughs> um, Zali, you have, um, I mean, we're having this conversation around about Minds Count and how we promote psychological health and well-being at such an interesting time in Australia's history and in global history, for that matter. Uh, you know, in terms, Sydney's been in lockdown for 70 days, 70 plus days. Melbourne, two, over 200 days since the pandemic began. They've been in lockdown. How have you coped? How have you, Tim, and the kids coped? during this time of lockdown and throughout the pandemic generally? Yeah, look, it, um, I've got to say, I'm sure it is for many people, but it is challenging. And I'm a very result-focused person and very goal-orientated. And mm. so at the moment in this kind of suspension time, you know, we can't really plan ahead because we don't know how long we'll be in lockdown for and borders and everything. It's really challenging to a person like me that I can't plan ahead. We've been in lockdown pretty much since I got back from uh, Parliament end of June. You know, yeah. we're heading into July school holidays, cancelled the ski holiday, um, <laughs> and we have been in lockdown ever since that. So yes. um, initially I probably enjoyed the, the slowing down of the pace and having a bit of a breather because it is 24-7 as a politician. It's very hectic. So mm. I did enjoy having a bit of time out and a bit of time at home. Mm. But now I do have to continually work on, you know, how you process from week to week, staying in the moment, really um, how do you find the, you know, the positives that keep you motivated without starting to get caught up in the sort of, you know, the it does feel like Groundhog, Groundhog Week. So you yep. have to find ways, metrics to try and plan ahead. And, and so I'm doing well. But, I, you know, I'm very conscious that this is really tough on a lot of people. And I, we get a lot of emails of constituents that are really struggling and, you know, businesses in a lot of distress, families that are separated in a lot of distress as well. Um, students, you know, year 12 students, university students really, really finding it tough. Mm. Um, so there, there's, there's, look, I feel incredibly lucky to be in a position to help so many people at such a challenging time. Yeah, absolutely. And we need leaders like you. So thank you for the role you're playing. Uh, and just in the chat, it'd actually be great to hear from you. We wanted to make tonight a little bit interactive through the Q&A, but also we're keen to hear how you're feeling. So in the chat, if there was one word that described how you're feeling right now, what would it be? Just one word, a uh, phrase if, if, you, if one word doesn't do it justice, but we'd love to hear just one word in the chat to reflect how you're feeling right now. Uh, after these 70 days of lockdown or 200 if you're in Melbourne and if you're outside of Melbourne and Sydney stay there <laughs> you're in a great place but how are you feeling it'd be lovely to hear your thoughts as they're coming through Zali can I ask you a question around what gives you hope I guess for life after the pandemic what are you looking forward to most um 
I really look forward to getting back out and about and uh, being able to plan ahead with some level of certainty. I think it's really important. As you said, introducing me, my downtime is doing ultra running. Uh, so that's 50 to 100 kilometer events. So you're out for a long time and that requires a lot of training. Mm. Um, and for me, I look at that, that's really active mindfulness where it really mm. gives you a time to you're physically active, but you have to be in the moment because you're concentrating on the track and the trail. So it gives me time to really process the stresses of my work life mm. um, and thinking time because you're cut off from social media and you actually have time to just be in nature, taking a few deep breaths and just being in the moment. So I look forward to being able to plan a few events. At the moment, I'm training <laughs> in a vacuum uh, without knowing when I will be able to do the next thing. But uh, look, I have to be realistic we also have a federal election coming within the next six to seven months so i i'm keen to get out and about that's for sure <laughs> and you mentioned mindfulness and again we want tonight to be interactive and practical and mindfulness is such a great strategy for working through these challenging times for making your mind count but i think a lot of people don't really understand what it's about how, how do you define mindfulness because uh, you touched on it beautifully just before yeah, look, mindfulness is trying to be in the moment. Don't be caught up in the past, you know, trying to sort of process things that have happened behind you and, you know, living in regret and, and sort of behind, but also not being in a sprint to the future where you're just everything you're doing is always towards what you're hoping to achieve. You, you know, you've got to enjoy the journey, not just the destination. And I learned that the hard way. Mm. Um, when I, As an athlete, when I was younger, I was very focused on the destination. You focus on winning that medal at the Olympics or the world champs, you know, and you spend, as a skier, a, a race was about 55 seconds. You have two runs of 55 seconds and you would train 365 days a year for you know a minute and a half so Incredible. if your whole sense of accomplishment and satisfaction is only linked to the outcome of that minute and a half it's it's a really tough equation to to live with and um i found that mostly when ironically when i won the world championships in 1999 in val and you know, I thought that would be the culmination of everything I'd ever trained for since I started ski racing, you know, when I was five and, you know, that this would just be it. And then I realised that you win it, you do the medal ceremony and then you go away and you go back to training and you go back to your next race. Yeah. So, you know, it's a very short-lived moment of sort of celebration. And so you need to attach pleasure and satisfaction out of, you know, doing it to more than just the moment of victory, because if not, it's very short lived. That's so, it's so interesting. And, and again, it's such a, a deep insight into high performance. So I, I saw you on the, the cover, I think it was the Sydney Morning Herald with Lane Beachley the other day. And uh, I spoke to Lane earlier this year and she said something similar around, you know, the outcome almost became less relevant is because she focused on the process. She focused on the, the training, the preparation. Um, and that, and she, that was kind of, it gave her a freedom just to ultimately sort of let the outcome go. And Ash Barty does that really well. She <laughs> seems to be so focused just on the process, again, the preparation, and then that gives her freedom about the outcome. And so when she loses, it seems to be a great way for her to recover quickly because she knows I couldn't have done anything more than I did to get to this point. Is, is that sort of, is that something you learned in sport as well? Absolutely. But also as a barrister, you know, in litigation you, uh, and in sport. So, you you know, at the end of the day, it's a very similar journey where you put in the hard work. You've got to do the training. You've got to do the preparation. You've got to have the team around you, get the expertise, do all that. Mm. But at the end of the day, you don't control the outcome. You know, the winning in a ski race, it's, you know, it's touch and go. There's an element of luck. I would say in court, you know, with respect to judges, there's an element of luck at times of, you know, how an argument will be interpreted or what where the evidence will fall. You know, there's always a range of outcomes that are possible and you don't control that. And so you have to learn to let that go. But that's not always an easy thing to do. And and I think in sport, you know, it varies how how successfully you manage that um look i went to four winter olympic games by the time i retired in 2002 i was quite um, i was finding it really difficult um and I, I haven't talked about it much why i retired in 2002 look mm. i was ready to go on to a professional career and do other things but i was having high level anxiety um around um just uh that um 
being able to like I was having sleepless nights couldn't sleep before events and was you know a lot of nervous tension mm. about uh competing it was that you know there was a real fear level uh, associated with it so mm -hmm. um you have to learn mechanisms and it's like training it's like developing endurance or physical ability you mm -hmm. actually have to train your mind to deal with those situations and and have coping strategies uh, mm -hmm. I remember you know in my early years of you know, rocking up to the bar table in court and you have that really strong, um, you know, uh, fight or flight reflex and yeah. you have to have those coping strategies to, to deal with it. And I still get it now in Parliament, and, you know, at times where you just, but you have to have those strategies. So I guess my, my, my approach has always been, you know, the mind is no different to your muscles and your technique mm -hmm. around what you're doing and you have to put some time into developing your strategy. Don't just assume it's going to be right and kick in on the day. So good. So good, Zali. Any tips on what your sort of go-to strategies are? I know there's a lot of different things you can do, but you're right, when you're in that flight or fight mode, you know, you've been caught off guard or something's come at you from left of centre. It's It can be very hard to regather. So any any tips on strategy, those coping strategies to get back centred and present? Yeah, look, I think obviously your prep will always be really important because your prep allows you to have confidence to fall back on you've no, done everything. Yeah. Um, my ultimate fallback is always what's the worst that can happen? You yeah. know, at the end of the day, a bit of embarrassment or humiliation is hardly the end of the world, um, you know, you should never be paralyzed by a fear of losing because that will stop you from having a go at a lot of things. So that's mm. never a problem. Mm. Um, ultimately, the coping strategies is falling back on your plan, having that mental plan of how you will deal with the situation. Breathing is really important, having awareness of your heart rate because mm. uh, obviously heart rate goes up and adrenaline and all that in those situations. Mm. Um, so it is falling back on having key plans, deep breath, and just focusing on what you can control. You know, all yeah. athletes we'll talk talk to you about that you should always focus on what you can control and let go of what you can't control because there's always a lot of that yeah. <laughs> and i would say in any professional career it's the same thing especially in litigation at the bar and certainly in politics um you know a, a lot of my work is reactive in where i have to respond to the government's agenda on issues mm. but when you have that opportunity to be proactive on issues like climate or you know integrity it is really good to be able to plan out what you want to do and, and sort of how you approach an issue. Um, and, and so then, you, you know, you have that opportunity to be more, uh, you know, constructive on, on an issue. Brilliant. Fantastic suggestions. And thank you for getting so practical because it's so important that we can learn from people like you as to what's worked. I mean, what hasn't as well. And and uh, over time, you've refined your methods and it's it's brilliant to hear those insights. So thank you very much. I, I've got to ask a question. I don't, we're going back a little way, but I understand, was it th you were 13 when you decided you want to go to the Olympics? I mean, most 13-year-olds these days are stuck gaming and on social media. They're not thinking about going to the Olympics. What? And then you've gone on and achieved all these amazing things. You've had three careers that any one person would be happy to have just one of them. What's driving you? What's behind your drive that's got you to, to, to achieve the things that you have? Um, look, I, I, to be fair to my parents and my brother, I'd say I was one of those pesky kids that was highly competitive and never <laughs> let go, right? So one of the hardest lessons I had to do as a kid was learn to lose gracefully, um, which was, you know, if you lost the race, you had to go and shake hands with the winners and, you know, and be be humble. Um, and so, you know, they the, the important lessons to learn. Um, look, so I was very driven. I've always been quite driven um, and I was a good junior skier, was one of the best in Europe for my age. And I remember watching those Olympic Games when I was 13 and, you know, I didn't worry about being Australian and skiing and winter sports weren't really the sports yeah. for Australia at the time. Yes, um, not but I just, know <laughs> Yeah, I just remember thinking quite, you know, I guess, nay, simplistically that yeah. someone has to make it to the top. At the end of the day, someone, every race, there will be a winner. You know, at every, you know, every Olympics, there are three winners per race. There's... Mm you know, gold, silver and bronze. Um, and so someone has to be in those roles. And if you can tick all those boxes to put yourself in that best position possible, why not? Who's mm. to say it's not? it can't be you? So yes. I was always, I guess, very upfront with 
I'm totally, you know, I want to set that goal and then I'll do everything I can to put myself in a position to achieve it. Mm. So, you know, from 13, I raced for Australia from the age of 15 as an international. When I was 17, I had to choose, do I do my HSC uh, or do I leave halfway through year 12 and go and compete to try and qualify for my first Olympics um, in Albeville in France. And yes. at the time, there were only two spots, uh, two spots for alpine skiing and the two top men skiers assumed they would have the spot. Yeah. And along came the little pesky 17-year-old who said, no, <laughs> I <don't think. laughs> I'll take a spot. So, you know, I've never let um, preconceived ideas limit what I thought I was capable of or what I should aim for. And I think that's really important too. Don't let other people's preconceived ideas or limitations limit your ambition. You know, yes. you have to be honest with yourself about what you hope to achieve yes. and then do everything you can to make that happen. Yeah. You've got a history of sort of taking on big challenges and often in male dominated arenas. Uh, any reflections on that? Yeah, look, I I look back on it, I've been incredibly lucky of having, I guess, strong role models in my parents, you know, both my parents are professionals um, and very strong about rights and equality and, and all of that. Um, and although I've got an older brother, there was never a sense of different opportunities for either of us. Mm. Um, and so I guess I've always just been encouraged to back myself and, you know, give it a go. And my parents have been very... Um, you know, incredibly supportive in terms of facilitating all my opportunities. So mm. I've certainly never looked at an industry and thought, oh, that's a male-dominated industry. I wouldn't mm. take that on. Mm. If anything, I probably thrive on the challenge of succeeding mm. in an industry where it might be that much harder. So um, I don't mind that aspect. It doesn't intimidate me, I guess that's how I would put it. Yes, and and if anything, it, it stimulates you. It makes you drive harder because you see the challenge in it, as opposed to the uh, you know the, the the risk or the barriers to it. It's fabulous. It's a great mind frame. Um, Izali, in law, your, any thoughts around the? Uh, my understanding is that from a graduate perspective, there's there's more females graduating in law now than than males. But still, as you get to the top, it's a classic scenario. More male partners typically in most firms than, than female. What do you think needs to change in that profession? To, to Yeah, do? look, I think, uh, ironically, parliament and politics is about 20 years behind the corporate world and the legal <laughs> world. So I've, I've sort of entered that whole nother time zone. But um, <laughs> look, there's no doubt there's a lot of unconscious bias still at play. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the status quo is there to preserve the status quo and doesn't lead to positive change. So we need to see more proactive work in that space. Mm. But I think, look, 2021 has been a pretty watershed year for culture, you know, work culture, workplace culture, and I would say, you know, um, toxic masculinity parliament in particular is an environment for it yeah. so i think there has been a real um you know a moment to really look at workplace culture equity policies how things are working because there is no doubt that with covid with lockdown there is that challenge around productivity and around having good workplace environments good balance um and the most successful companies and and work environments are the ones with good gender equity policy, good diversity, yeah. because you get more views around the table and so then you have a much more cohesive team. So at the end of the day, um, a, a better policy breeds success and I think that's the strongest message. Mm. Uh, for too long there's been a sense that if we um, try and argue for getting rid of the imbalance, that someone's going to lose, someone's going to miss out. And then the status quo gets very defensive and wants to hold on to their position of advantage. Mm. And I think we need to reframe it that it's actually to everyone's best interest. But ironically, that's a that's an argument we have around a lot of policy areas, whether it's gender equity, um, but around climate, you know, around a lot of policies where people are fearful of change or fearful of losing something they have in the status quo instead of looking to um, how much opportunity there is in moving forward doing things better 
Zali, can I change the topic very slightly just because of a couple of questions that are coming through, which are fabulous. Uh, Justice Jago, as well as uh, Rod Levy on, on, on the chat. And please, again, submit your questions. We'd love to hear them. They both had a similar similar question which around the, the sort of responsibility of, of uh, the leaders in practice or in general counsel really looking after the mental health of their, their more junior lawyers. Uh, wh what do you see the role of, you know, how, how does the role of leadership play out when it comes to a topic like mental health and wellbeing? Yeah, absolutely, there is responsibility. Um, I think there's also maybe needs to be awareness that not everyone's got the answer. You know, everyone doesn't have the answers. And so just because someone is more advanced in their career or has more maybe, um, you know, is more reassured by their, their level of achievement doesn't mean they have the answers around mental health. So I think it is a, still about seeking to understand um, and, you know, uh, and being informed about the issues, the triggers, what might be happening, um, but also understanding different perspectives. You know, some leaders might be um, more, more attuned to mental health concerns than others, and if you know it's not your strength then you've got to try and make an effort, you know, you've got to be more informed. But there's no doubt we need leadership around that. Mm. Um, it's much more obviously acknowledged and talked about as a challenge, but from a health point of view, we still treat physical health, illness, you know, injury much differently to how we treat mental health or injury. Yes. Um, and that's one of the things I've sort of always really wanted us to shift to thinking of mental health as being separate to physical health, because if you <laughs> present at a hospital, um, you will, of course, um, you know, if you present with a broken leg, you'll get swift through emergency and dealt with because something mm. very physical, very upfront is visible. But mm. if you're going in, uh, if you're presenting with an, uh, an, an emergency from a mental health point of view, it's a much different treatment. And we need to move away from differentiating what's immediately visible compared to what's not yes. um, to understand a more holistic side of health you know i think and in a workplace if you think about it it's much easier for an employer to recognize the need for a sick day or for a challenge if they can see that there's a physical ailment at play. Yeah, yeah much harder when it's a mental health so that it is about needing to be very aware of, of challenges and it's and we've made some progress but you're right it still feels like there's so far to go and uh I know I had a, a, a you know significant sort of mental challenge uh, a number of years ago, and I and I think I was I was too concerned that if I brought it up that people would just look at me differently, and and so I just you know sort of work was my ended up being my outlet, and I sort of mm -hmm. avoided having to deal with it because I could go to work and just focus on the task. And it's sad to think that sometimes work is the escape from people's mental reality um, because it might be adding to it in the first instance. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, I mean, in politics, how do you deal with the, the, the negativity and the, the I mean, in your, during your election campaign, the, the, the smear campaign that came against you, the, I, I mean, I just can't imagine the pressure uh, beyond law, beyond sport. Politics just takes it to a whole nother level. How, how, how do you sort of, again, keep yourself in that space where you can keep focused on what matters and and move forward when there's potentially so much negativity and and just inaccuracy uh out there all around you and negativity any any thoughts there yeah look i mean it was one thing that everyone warned me about you know everyone fears and, and you know that preconceived idea that politics is this horrible negative you know adversarial environment um and you know just how how grotty and horrible and unfortunately i'd say my predecessor probably added to that in that he introduced a very um adversarial very combative style of opposition politics especially you know in, i think in relation to women so that you know, I think that that has fed, uh, it's been a downward spiral in politics. But I guess I felt that I had the best preparation possible. As having been an athlete, you have to be very open to criticism. As an athlete, you're unless you're standing on the top spot of the podium, you are going to be criticised. You know, at some, your coach will tell you what you could have done better. The media will say whether it was good or not. You know, you spot, everyone will have a view. So you learn very quickly to take what's beneficial from all that feedback so if it's constructive feedback or something you could have done better 
that's great. But then you really dump it. You, you let it go because you have to focus on your next race and your next event. And it's the same as a barrister. You have to focus on your next case. There's, you have to learn your lesson from what may have gone right or wrong from a litigation, but then you have to focus on your next day because if not, you'll be paralysed. So I did feel that for politics I had that best of both worlds of having had my prepping the public eye as an athlete and the criticism and then having the, um, you know, the, the, the pressure as a, prof as a barrister in terms of having to deal with, you know, the demands of, um, you know, of the arguments of litigation or, or of legislation of, you know, being, you know, taking on experts' views and, un, you know, having to understand lots of different topics. Mm. Um, and then the politics, look, funnily enough, it wasn't as nasty as I thought it was going to be. Right. Everyone had set my expectations so low of how nasty politics was going to be. In the <laughs> end, I didn't, you know, yes, there's a lot of negativity, but seriously, it's water. it was a little bit like water off a duck's back for me because, I always look at that, that it reflects a lot more on those doing it than mm. on me. I don't see that as mm. true criticisms of me. Mm. And it was funny during the campaign, a lot of my team felt the critic and my family were more affected by the trolls and the negativity than yes. I was. Yes. Um, and so I had to kind of really reassure everyone that it was fine. It really didn't bother me and, and um, it wasn't part of it. But yeah. it's also the standard you decide to go by. So our campaign yes. policy was the three P's of being polite, positive and prepared. And so everyone, every volunteer, everyone had to sign up to that motto. And ironically, Helen Haynes in Indi had very similar thing. It was be your best self. So everyone always had to, you know, Michelle Obama said, when they go low, you go high. And it was really about what do we want to stand for? And as an independent, it was about I didn't want to do the old style of politics. I didn't want to get in the gutter. I just wanted to focus on what I could offer, what I was proposing, and we wanted it to be a positive experience. And as a result, we had a huge volunteer turnout People had fun and people who had never been involved in politics before loved being volunteers, loved going out. I mean, it helps with, the, you know, bright turquoise colours and stuff like that. But <laughs> it was an incredibly empowering, positive experience. Yes. And that brings so many more people on board than the negative. You know, fear is, you know, that fear, fear and smear is what's mainstay in Australian politics. But at the end of the day, that does not bring people on board. You know, there's nothing motivating. You're not going to get the best out of people by making them fear things. Yes. It's by making them inspired that you'll you'll achieve a lot more. I love it. I love it. The three Ps. So polite, uh, positive, positive, and prepared. And, and there's prepared. probably a fourth P in there, which is purposeful. I understand purpose <laughs> is, a, is a big driver from your point of view. How how does purpose play out yeah. in in across your career? as much as anything for innovation yeah yeah no I mean for me purpose is I am a very goal-oriented you know driven person um I get very restless if I feel aimless which is mm. you know my challenge is actually uh slowing down at times and yeah. and you know not and my poor team gets driven from you know project to project um but for me, that's really what makes me tick is that um, it is that sort of drive and an and opportunity to, to achieve things. Um, and, and purpose is really important. I mean, we have we are at a time in history with some we have serious opportunities and serious challenges. So I do feel um, we have that responsibility to, to play our part. And um, I have teenage kids and, you know, I, I feel like I've been I've been given an amazing deck of cards in terms of opportunity in my professional life. Um, I don't think I've wasted them. You know, I've made the most of them. That's for sure. But I also feel incredibly privileged to have had those opportunities and I do feel yeah. it's, you know, I mean, you, have, you need to give back. Yeah. A lot of companies these days kind of purpose wash things. You know, they, they put a bit of a spin on it and talk about the why, but fewer companies do it really authentically do you, any thoughts around you know in the in the law profession just how purpose can play a role there uh you know moving beyond the sort of the yeah just to lift the the focus on the the bigger agenda at hand yeah look and i think what it, it's been really interesting watching the evolution since 2019 I think, you know, around environment and climate and some of our big global challenges we face, mm. um, the, the corporate world has really embraced the challenges and the need to transition and to need to look at 
the ESG policies and how, you know, how are they, what role the private sector and law firms play in, you know, your, your stakeholders, your employees. I think, you know, younger generations have a real sense of, want a sense of purpose around their work. Mm. Um, and so, you know, employers need to provide that, need to real, really tick all those boxes to keep people on, to keep them driven, um, because we do have big challenges. You know, we're, we're at an interesting point in time with around climate in particular. It's creating a lot of anxiety. You know, people are really doubtful of what the future holds, what, um, you know, I see school kids all the time who, you know, they're really, they can be really negative about the future, and that's really scary because... Yes. If hope is not in our younger generation, you know, how are we going to drive enthusiasm um, and 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 uh, productivity and, and sort of you know and purpose? Mm. So we need it, it. Really, is important to be always looking at you know the glass is half full, it's not half empty. And if you have challenges, how do you break them down into being able to solve them? And there isn't not everything's going to be able to be solved, but you know it. it you can't curl up in a ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as I said I before, guess... it's focusing on what you can control yeah. and uh, and then focusing on what is working as well. Yeah. There's so much to focus on that maybe isn't. But there's always, it depends where your energy goes and um, and your attention sort of goes as well. So it's, it's, it's great. So focusing on the things that are going to, inspire you and motivate you sounds like it's part of part of your your strategy yeah well look if i look at my you know shift from as a barrister to politics mm. i was feeling incredibly frustrated at gender equity issues that we didn't have more women in parliament mm. um you know i was on boards where we still didn't have proper equity equitable representation on the board um i was a um i was an arbitrator for the court international court of arbitration for sports i was in pyeongchang you know arbitrating for sport and Sport is generally considered fairly fair because you have clear rules of engagement, and especially sports that I've done are against the clock. So you're either fast or you're not. It's really cut, it's really clear. Mm. But professionally, I was really at that point of feeling like we need, um, you know, I, I was looking for different outcomes. And, but, and then I really thought about, well, I can't complain about the status quo if I'm not prepared to get off the sidelines and get involved. Um, mm -hmm. And so that really drove me to get into politics was to, to A, give people another choice, mm -hmm. um, but show that you could do it a little bit differently. You didn't have to do it the old way. So, yeah. look, I, I think uh, it's really important to motivate people to look for solutions and think outside the box of what you can do. Brilliant. Mel, can I bring you in? You had a wonderful question about vulnerability. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Mel, be lovely to hear that from you. Oh, sure. Um, thank you, Zali. Great, um, great discussion and plenty of engagement, which is excellent to see. Um, I guess my question was around as a leader, um, and obviously you've worked in different environments as well. You know, do you find it particularly challenging showing sort of your own vulnerability and I know from a leadership perspective, it can be incredibly um, important, particularly when others are looking to relate and seeing the human side of leadership. Yeah, it's, um, and it's really important. And I, I'm probably not the best at it because I tend to be very in my head and very focused. Um, but it is really important to acknowledge when things are tough or when things are challenging so that, you know, and that vulnerability um because you do in the especially in public life in, in politics you do have to have a certain shell because you are open for a huge amount of criticism um and it, it is a, a highly competitive world um but you have to be able to get beyond that and you know i guess your vulnerabilities can be in different ways like if i think about it politically it's also opening up to people on both sides of the you know political spectrum to discuss policies to discuss opportunities compromise how do we achieve things not everything has to be for the win you know it, it is about uh sort of working together um, and, and, and accepting the limitations sometimes of what can be achieved. You know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good um, mm. because you have to, you know, things be, can be achieved gradually. Um, but, yeah, vulnerabilities, it's important to be able to share them so that people understand that no one is 
uh, you know, impenetrable or involved, you know, like so, um, you know, I, I've certainly had plenty of moments that have been really intimidating and you can really have to deal with, with those um, circumstances. But I think at the end of the day, it does make you stronger. Zali, to build on that, if you could go back to those really dark times, the really toughest times in your life, what advice would you give yourself? <laughs> um, yeah, look, it, it's a, a, you know, stick with it. Um, it's okay. You're on the right track. Yes. Um, there, there is no right or wrong. There is no, um, I, I firmly believe the only decisions you regret are the ones you're not brave enough to take. Hmm. Um, and so it's not about don't have a fear of failure. Don't think there's a wrong answer. There are choices and you're going to make choices and certain things will evolve from those choices, hmm. but there's no right or wrong answer. So, hmm. um, you know, where maybe in the past, you know, I've worried about decisions. Um, it, it is about uh, back yourself, you know, it's, you know, don't second guess yourself. So, yes. but it's, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, I don't regret anything. I've had, an, you know, amazing opportunities and um, being part of the conversation and the debate now on where we're at with parliament, but around mm -hmm. workplace issues, you know, we just passed a, um, the amendment to the uh, Sexual um, Discrimination Act. Mm. It obviously a lot more work needing to be done about the Respect at Work report. Mm. We still have, you know, great inequities around parental leave and childcare and, and, and a lot of <laughs> we need an integrity commission, you know, don't get me started on the list of things that we need to do. Um, but so for me, it's, you know, I, I would go back and, and say, you've got this, you're, you're on the right path. I love it. It's beautiful. I, I think your grand, was it your grand that's always said to you, your only regret is if you don't try? Is that is where you it, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I, I firmly believe that, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, you should, you should never divide, define success with winning because that's really no. not what it's about. Success is actually knowing you've given it 110%. Brilliant. So, you know, so it doesn't matter what it is. And, and like you said, I'm, I'm crazy enough to like doing 100K ultra events and I can assure <laughs> you there are moments in those events, you know, middle of the night where you, you've hit the wall, physically you're exhausted, but yes. it's a real challenge mentally yes. to regroup and stay focused on what you're trying to do and why you're there and yes. what you get out of it. Amazing. Uh, Christian Marchant had a fabulous question. Christian, I, if, if you're happy to unmute yourself, it'd be lovely to hear it in your voice, if that's okay. Are you, are you still with us, Christian? Thought we'd go a little bit experimental here, Zali, but... Uh, Good game. <laughs> have we got you, Christian? That's okay if not. But basically, Christian's question was around the the drive the sort of the motivation as you get older are you finding that what's driving your motivation is actually changing um as i'm getting older i'm mostly finding i'm getting more patient mm -hmm. um i was a very impatient very um you know, uh, when I, as a ski racer, I was very hard on my coaches because if I was driving myself 110%, I expected that of everyone else. And so that could be quite, you know, you, you sort of want things to happen faster. I yes. think now I have more perspective and I can appreciate that things take time, that takes planning, and mm. sometimes the building blocks are more gradual, yes. but they're just as worthy of the, as the ultimate outcome. Um, yeah. So that's probably what I've learned most um, in, in, in trying to, you know, especially in this current my current career. Obviously, it's not a minority government. I don't have the balance of power. So what you're really doing is, A, representing your constituents, but really trying to move the debate on important issues put forward i would say sensible solutions you know alternative approaches create pressure which moves the debate and forces government and major parties to engage with issues that they wouldn't normally choose to engage with mm -hmm. um, so they're they're kind of the areas that i i really you know probably engage with the the, the most and climate clearly is a is a huge passion of yours and uh, I know you're almost famous for sort of always having a plan B, but when it comes to the planet, there is no plan B. Uh, what do we, what's, wh where are we going here and what needs to be different to, to make some serious progress in this country? 
Yeah, look, and it's an interesting, I think the debate has moved a lot in the last three years. Um, and I've certainly been, you know, with my team, we've worked as hard as we could to do that. Mm. Um, trying to get away from the, the political football, you know, the very, um, the, the climate wars that we've had for 10 years in Australia and a lot of misinformation around it, to really focus on the opportunity. Um, there's no doubt there's a lot of risk that comes with global warming. Uh, we saw that with the 2019 fires. It will have a profound impact on the economy, our environment, our way of life, our health. But if you focus on those negatives, it gets really paralysing for people. So it's really important to focus on the opportunities of the transition. And the good news is the world is transitioning. You know, this is yes. beyond debate and we're approaching to COP26 our major trading partners have all committed to net zero by 2050. Um, and Australia is in an interesting situation. We are being left behind. You know, there's no doubt about that. We're not doing enough. Um, fossil fuels are still being uh, funded at a rate of about 80 to 1 compared to renewable technologies. So we are still spending a huge amount on holding on to old technologies that are ironically adding to the cost of what we'll have in the future. So that's incredibly mm. frustrating. Mm. But the pressure's on. Look, the, the government is under pressure. But mm. more importantly, I think people are putting them under pressure because we've got state governments, we've got the corporate sector, uh, industry business everyone is focused on the challenge but the opportunities and so that has very much moved the debate but there there is no doubt the pressure is on for the government to move its policy mm. um and my goal is very much to make climate the number one issue for the upcoming federal election mm. to ensure that we have change ideally i want two yeah. more independents on the crossbench um <laughs> so that you know the balance of power can really be move things along yes um but there, there is great opportunity, uh, and that's really important. Obviously, the US President Biden has really made it clear that he wants to lead on climate. The UK, uh, Prime Minister Johnson, is, is also very focused on it. So you are having momentum from key dro international drivers. Mm. And, and you have to think about it. It's not just from a policy point of view. It's sheer dollars in the market, you know, where so much of the recovery packages from COVID are focused on not just, you know, recovering from COVID pandemic kind of recessions, mm. but building smarter and better for the future, addressing those challenges. And we're seeing, you know, such a rapid transition to renewable energy, rapid transition around the world to electric vehicles, um, new industries developing, you know, green hydrogen. So the opportunities are coming online. Uh, I am worried that Australia is going to be very much left behind from some opportunities and mm. the, the indicators are we're already seen as a difficult legislation to invest in because we don't have the right policy metrics in place to make it a good jurisdiction for, for the international um, investors. But um, I think awareness of that from the public is really growing. And so that will put pressure on uh, on, on both major parties. I think both uh, have their issues <laughs> in terms of this um, and need to be held to account because the challenges are going to be so great. But look, COVID has also changed a lot of the way we yeah. work, you know, a lot more flexible working. I don't think that everyone will go back to life as was before COVID. I think there has mm. been that shift. Mm. Um, and that shift in many ways has been beneficial, you know, mm. less travel. I think a lot less, you know, corporate travel interstate, you know, flying around for meetings. Mm. There's efficiencies that have been gained by COVID that mm. I think will be held on to. Uh, mm. But but obviously we you know we we absolutely need to do more. Uh, you, and one thing that's really striking me about this conversation, Zali, is just how optimistic you are. Yes, you're you're a, and from a psychological point of view, there's an interesting there was an interesting piece of research they did a few years ago where they compared the uh, the sort of the life well being, psychological well being of people that were optimistic, pessimistic. But who, they found that people that had the highest well-being were the ones that were realistic optimists. So somewhere in between the two, and I would say that's you. I mean, what you've just said is exactly it. You're acknowledging the challenges, but you're also celebrating the opportunity and you're seeing the potential. Mm -hmm. And so it's just this wonderful balance of 
being realistic, but also optimistic about where we're heading. And that must, for your own mind, give you confidence and buoy you on to really, really make, make a change and make positive ground wherever you can. Yeah, look, I don't know, it would be interesting to hear from the audience as well, but I feel I get a lot of comfort in planning, in having a, you know, you know, if the goal is going to be around better legislation, what does that legislation look like? What do you need to do? Mm. How do you get to that? Um, Obviously, we need to get to net zero as soon as possible. What's the journey to that? What are the, what are the things we could put in place that would assist us getting that? So when I was, for example, drafting um, the climate change bills that I introduced to Parliament, um, I was very much looking at that. I wasn't trying to, it's not about wedging, it's not trying to score a win on one side or the other. Mm-hmm. It was actually about trying to, how do we bring everyone to the table, respecting that there's a wide variety of views, mm-hmm. but how do we put forward something that's going to help the vast majority and address the risks and the, you know, embrace the opportunities, but address the risks and challenges. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really, really important to do that. Um, so, Right. Yes, I think you've got me right. <laughs> that's yeah, probably how I'd right. describe myself. It's a wonderful uh, category to be in, that's for sure. Quick question, Zali, from a, a legal profession point of view, for those that are considering going into politics, how has your, how did your legal career prepare you for, for politics? Yeah, I think lawyers are the biggest category in the political in the in politics. So if I looked at career paths of people in parliament. I think lawyers is the biggest group. Don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. (laughs) uh, Look, I feel strongly politics needs more uh, professional people, but people with career experience. Um, um, I really think it's important that people have that experience in the private sector, in, in, you know, outside of politics. I'm concerned that politics in the last 10, 15 years has become a career path Mm. where straight out of uni, go and be an advisor, work your way up through a party machine, and then your sense of perspective and, you know, respect for other views is really tainted by just your limited experience. Um, And it creates a certain type of politics which I don't think is ultimately beneficial for our democracy or for Australia. Um, So I do think we need a a, a proportion of parliamentarians to be from, um, you know, have some life experience and some professional skills around the table. Also, I mean, what you may not appreciate is when ministers are given portfolios, they don't particularly have affinity for that portfolio. You know, they they are not, you know, and so you are having to become an expert at understanding really specific things around your portfolio without particular knowledge or experience about it. It's just a political appointment. And I've found that really, really stunning in some of my meetings where, uh, you know, for me as a barrister, I was used to, you're not an expert of everything, so you have to go and get expert opinions and I get briefed by a lot of people who tell me the facts around different policy areas and I can then assess that evidence and work through as to what I think is the right policy position to put forward. Um, But you have people in, in in departments and advisors and ministers who don't particularly know that area and so their whole approach to the area is tainted by the party view you know the party politics Mm -hmm. or the policy approach and i don't know that that's always a great outcome um and and, you know so consultation is really important uh the way i know helen haynes is an independent and i approach it we have a system of you know for every piece of legislation that comes forward you know, we sort of have a process of is it good law? You know, what is it seeking to achieve? Is it a gap it's filling? Is it the result of an inquiry? Uh, What submissions have we received from the law council, from, you know, ethics groups, anyone that's going to be impacted? What feedback have I had from the electorate on it? So you can really do a, you know, a sort of a rational threshold analysis of it Mm. rather than just having a gut feel, you know, political wedging kind of approach. And I Mm -hmm. think that's really important. When you look at legislation, you know, has there been consultation around it? Are they open to amendments? All, all those aspects are really important. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's yeah. an interesting environment. 
So would you encourage the legal profession to come into politics based on your experience? Is it a good... Absolutely. I, especially young people too. And I know, I guess, when I say don't come straight into being an MP, but come, being advisors, understanding, especially women, I know there was a survey done that young women, uh, 18 to 25, 0% wanted to get into politics. And that is frightening um, <laughs> because you have to have a seat at the table. If not, policies won't take into account your perspective your you know how the legislation will impact you um, and a lot of legislation is gender biased you know it has impacts so unless you have that diversity of gender around the table to appreciate that impact mm. it's just going to get overlooked mm. and we've seen that with the last couple of budgets around a couple of issues so um, for young lawyers I'd say you get involved in you know in policy and politics and I know politics is now viewed as a bit of a, you know, maybe a negative thing and, you know, people don't engage with politics. It's very, you know, the trust in politicians has really dropped. But sitting on the sidelines is not going to fix it. Uh, you have to participate in it. We are incredibly lucky to have a, you know, a sound democracy. We have compulsory voting, so you have to exercise a choice. Um, so it's really important to engage with it because at the end of the day, your vote, your choices Mm. will give rise to laws that will impact your life, you know, and there's no point in complaining later that you don't like those laws. <laughs> exactly. you, know, you, have, you have to engage with it. So yeah. get in uh, the arena. It's good. Yeah, it's really important for, for young people and young lawyers to engage with the issues, have the debate, have the discussions. Yes. Wonderful. Well, Zali, I've been, the questions I've been sharing have been ones that I'm getting on text as well as in the chat. So thank you to everybody that has has raised questions. One final question from somebody in uh, I got via text actually is uh, pertinent and, and a nice way to wrap up this whole, whole dialogue tonight, which is if you could go back to yourself at the beginning of your career, uh, just when you were really sort of starting out and uh, what advice would you give yourself at that time of your life? I guess the question would be for me is which career? <laughs> yeah, I know. I certainly thought about that. So yeah. your pro professional career in law? I go back to the 17-year-old, you know, throwing herself into <laughs> professional skiing or do I go back to lawyer, you know? Yes. I, um, if, we focus, if we focus on the start of your or, law career. Or, or as a politician, you know? I yeah. think, um, look, at, at the moment, you know, have a, a clear, have clear, my advice is always though, know why you're doing it and what you're doing it for um, yeah. because if you if you have a clear view of what you're hoping to achieve you can navigate the journey there you know you could the ups and downs and the disappointments and the successes all of that comes into perspective if you know what you're ultimately trying to achieve yeah. and I don't know what I want to achieve <laughs> um, and so you know when I was at, um, in 2002 I did my final press conference at the Olympic Games and I'd fallen it was my last race and you know I was incredibly heartbroken about it but I had a journalist say to me what do you think's the highlight of your life and and I said well Geez, I mean, I'm 27. I really hope I haven't had it yet. Uh, <laughs> there's a long way to go. Um, so that's what, you know, I get excited about. There's so much more to do. Yeah, wonderful. Brilliant. Well, with that, Zali, thank you so much for making the time tonight. I'm going to hand over to David, who who will do the official vote of thanks and then take us into the next part of this evening's session. But really appreciate, again, you making the time. Wonderful insights shared. And congratulations on everything you've achieved. And we look forward to seeing what's next. If you've had three careers so far, how many more? I don't know there are to go. But whatever they are, we know you'll be an incredible success. So thank you so much, Zali Stegel. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Over to you, David. Thanks, Trish. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I'll, um, I'll actually be doing the uh, award of the um, the Mines Count Annual Awards, and uh, and actually I'll then hand across to uh, Justice Jane Jago to do the uh, the vote of thanks. Thank you. Um, so uh, we launched the uh, the Mines Count Annual Awards in 2019 to recognise leadership in mental wellbeing in Australian legal workplaces. Uh, as you'd be aware, there are many other awards programs in the Australian legal profession, and increasingly these programs are including awards for wellbeing and mental health. But at Minds Count, uh, we think it's important that we're also playing our role in recognising and encouraging leadership in this field, as well as using the opportunity to compile a survey of best practice in the profession. Um, there are two categories in the awards, the Best Mental Wellbeing Initiative in a Legal Workplace for Organisations and the Individual Leadership in, mental, in, in Legal Mental Wellbeing Award for Individuals. 
uh, we've chosen not to make an award in the category for individuals this year. So the criteria for the award for organizations are leadership commitment, innovation, effective implementation, staff awareness and participation, and prioritized targeting of meaningful issues. Uh, this year's winner of the best mental well-being initiative in a legal workplace already had a wide range of existing mental health initiatives, including a dedicated mental health committee, a team of mental health ambassadors, annual mental health days, and use of the Headspace app and an employee assistance program. Uh, the initiative that was, in, was nominated for the award was their peer-to-peer -peer acknowledgement platform called the Appreciate Program. Uh, while the platform was originally launched, launched in 2016, it's taken on a, a renewed significance with dramatically increased usage during the 2020 COVID lockdowns. Employees can nominate, other, other, can nominate any other employee for recognition via an e-card system to encourage effort, celebrate a milestone, spotlight excellence or recognize results. The organization saw a dramatic increase in use of the platform during COVID percent between 2018 and 2020, and an increase of more than 130%. And it looks like the bandwidth is dropping. I might just uh, drop the, uh, the video. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things we particularly appreciated about this initiative was the explicit acknowledgement of the value for the employee providing the recognition. Uh, it's as powerful to express appreciation and gratitude as it is to receive it. Uh, beyond that, um, the program has deep buy-in from the organization's high, from the executive sponsors of wellbeing. Uh, the winner of the MindScout Foundation Best Mental Wellbeing Initiative in a Legal Workplace for 2020 is Thompson Reuters. So congratulations to the team at Thomson Reuters. Can I pause for a moment to thank our judging panel for taking the time to review the submissions and uh, just uh, please join me in congratulating the, the nominees and the winner of the award of this year's Minds Count Foundation Annual Award. And please start planning your submissions for next year's awards. And with that, I will hand across to Justice Jane Jago. On behalf of the Minds Count organisation, its board and signatories, and all of the participants in tonight's lecture, I extend our heartfelt thanks to Zali Stegel, OAN MP, for sharing her experiences with us. To hear about Zali's experiences and insights has been a privilege. Uh, she has a unique perspective on the pressures of high performance in sports, litigation, and politics three things which are about as high pressure as you can get in life. Her focus on the opportunities she has been given and the need to make a positive contribution in our world uh, by making the most of those opportunities, as well as giving back to people, uh, is, I have to say, refreshing and uh, replenishing uh, to hear, and I'm sure we'll all agree. The objective of Minds Count to promote workplace psychological health and safety in the legal community is more pressing than ever. The past 18 months have exposed the fragility of the things in life we once took for granted. When the fragile foundations of our existence are exposed, be it by reason of death, divorce, familial estrangement, un or underemployment, uh, or laws to reign in a pandemic, our psychological health comes under pressure. We are all suffering some kind of loss, be it financial, be it loss of human contact, be it a loss of activities or simply a loss of time to do the things we enjoyed. Uh, but loss there undeniably is. We all experience stress, anxiety and sadness in our lives. All this is normal. As the current circumstances directly imposing some of these losses on us recede, which we all hope they will, workplaces have a vital role in ensuring we can regain our equilibrium. My own insight from the last 18 months is that a focus on work not being a potential negative influence on our wellbeing is simply too confined. The pressure of unrealistic demands and expectations and in the law, the need to get things done and to get them done right uh, can seem relentless. 
In this context, ensuring our workplaces do not harm our mental health is essential. But if the pandemic has shown anything, it is that work can and should be a force for positive support to our psychological well-being. Work can give us structure, a way to make positive contributions. It can give us community. It can make us feel worthwhile and valued. It can give us human connections. It can give us dignity. Of course, workplaces should be safe. Of course, workplaces should not undermine a person's physical or psychological health or safety. The guidelines promoted by uh, Minds Health recognise these and other attributes that should underpin all workplaces. But the guidelines also recognise something more, that a psychologically safe and healthy workplace is not one that simply does no harm to our psychological and mental health. Doing no harm should be a given. A psychologically safe and healthy workplace is one that is actually good for our psychological and mental health. As we move from a life dominated by pandemic disease responses to hopefully endemic disease management, we will be left behind if we don't confront the fact that workers of today don't want a workplace that just does them no harm. They want a workplace which does them good. I see that as our next challenge. And if workplaces don't catch up, they will be left behind. Many thanks again to Zali for sharing her insights with us. We wish you all good health, peace of mind, and good night. Thank you. Thank you all. Good evening. <laughs> Bye.